Merci, Jacques. Uh, once again, uh, if there's anybody who at any point can't hear me, if you would just raise your hand, we will try to deal with it as best as we can. And I, some of what I'm going to say will presume the previous two talks. And uh, so I hope if there's anybody who feels they didn't quite get exactly something, if you would talk to other people who've been here at the other two talks. But I will repeat where I think it's important to do that. We've been talking uh, the last morning and evening about the location of theology or the locus of theology. How does where we live affect how we see and what we believe? How does to affect our thinking, our feeling, and our believing? And as I was closing off today, I was referring to uh, some of the recent efforts in theology to begin to take the experience of the poor and the marginalized more seriously. And I suggested, just by way of caution, that, that that is extremely important for us to do. As long as we are aware that the issues that face us, the problems that face us, the system that we live in is wrong, not only because it affects these people, but because it affects all of us. I think um, the present context we live in is dehumanizing for everyone. And I think it's important that we begin to articulate um, what that means. At the beginning of these talks last night, I referred back to the Second Vatican Council, and we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of that great event this fall. And one of the key documents from that council was the church in the modern world. It signaled this bold initiative to embrace the modern world and to go out and meet the world instead of living some kind of separate existence as a church. And I talked last night about how, as people in Latin America became more engaged in the modern world, they began to see the shadow side of the modern world. And I think here in North America, something similar is happening. We became engaged in the modern world at a very optimistic time in the West. And increasingly, I think we are beginning to see the shadow, the shadow side of the modern world. And the center of that modern world politically, the leader, has been the United States. And we are the closest colony of the heart of the modern world, of the West. And so we are experiencing, I think, rather closely the crisis of the modern world. And I suggested last night that our challenge now is to find the role of the church in the postmodern world, not the modern world. I'm hearing things back here. I don't think it's angels. Is this distracting for people? Or is there anything we can do about this? If you'll just be patient, let's see what we can do. Because I know sometimes it can, you'll be exhausted by the end of the talk listening to this. <laughs> Maybe just uh, by way of uh, filling in while we're waiting. Uh, this morning I was suggesting that one of the key questions for a Canadian theology is where is here? 
that we need to learn how to be here. So if I'll just tell you a little story uh, while we're waiting, a true story of a young student in New York who was studying to be a rabbi and he was doing his field education at a mental institution. And uh, so his first, one of his first tasks was to give the homily for the High Holy Days, Passover and so on. And as you know, in the Jewish tradition, on the Paso in the Passover meal, um, one of the youngest child asks the father, why are we here? You know, why is this night different from every, every other night? And so the young student, it was Friday night, the beginning of Passover and all the patients in the mental home came into the little synagogue that was there and they lined up and he started his homily and it had this kind of cumulative effect where he said well 2,000 years ago and 4,000 years ago and we went here and we went there and done we and now my brothers and sisters why are we here and one old man right at the back of the room said, well, Rabbi, maybe because we're not all there. <laughs> so I told that story quite often, but I, I just love it. I enjoy it a lot. How are we doing on the noise front? Does it seem to be okay? Okay, let's proceed with caution. <laughs> so, <clears throat> we're here. <laughs> uh, and I want to, to suggest to you that, that where we are now is quite different from where we were 25 years ago. That we are no longer as optimistic about the modern world as we were then. I think um, in order to discuss this a little bit further, I wanted to just briefly outline what most people understand by the modern world. They would say it is the world that has developed since the time of the Enlightenment, since the 18th century. The dawn of modern science, when people began to discover the scientific method, began to believe that there were uh, laws that governed the universe, that these laws could be discovered with the human mind, and that human beings could make tools that could change the shape of the universe. And so, over a period of time, we have a shift away from understanding the universe as being held by God in an ordered kind of way to seeing the universe as something made by human beings through science and through technology. And so we have over that whole period of time what people saw as enlightenment, as progress, which meant throwing off the bonds of the past, getting rid of the shackles of religion, of tradition, of a whole ordered world view. And the highest ideal of this modern world fashioned by human beings was the individual. The highest achievement was to become an autonomous, and a free human being and an individual. And the individual became the primary point of reference in all political arrangements and social and economic arrangements. And so we have liberal capitalism. The disillusionment with this whole modern vision of the world has been going on for some time in Europe. I think specifically since the war, but even before that, since the First World War. In Europe, there was a sense that something wasn't working, that this world that was supposed to be so human was in fact dehumanizing. 
Now, I think what's important to remember there is that in Europe, people had a much longer memory. They could think back, remember back to times before the Enlightenment, that there was a Europe, that there were other ways of living before the time of the Enlightenment. But I think here in North America, the disillusionment with the modern world is felt much, much more deeply. Basically, all we have in terms of historical memory is the last 200 years. For most Americans, most Canadians, our historical experience has been shaped by the dreams and the illusions of the modern world. And so I think that our disillusionment is all the greater because of this. I think, in fact, and you see this especially in Americans, for them it's really normal to be optimistic about what they can do, about how the world is, and about technology. That has been a normal way of living for them. They don't have the long memory of the distrust of the world, the longer memory of the humility of human experience. I think here in Canada, our experience is a little bit more modified than that of the Americans. There's been a long history in Canada. You know, that we are a country that was built up in resistance to the American Revolution and all that that implied the values of the Enlightenment, the modern world. And the loyalists who came to Canada and who shaped much of our national tradition and, and that some of our, our especially Protestant religious experience was based on a kind of suspicion of what was modern, a suspicion of the Enlightenment and technology and so on. And really the great voice for that suspicion has been George Webster Grant, who was long associated with the Maritimes. But he really hoped for the fact that Canada could be this place of resistance to what he saw as the illusion of modernism. Now, in the past, that kind of resistance to modernism, to change in technology, has made us seem very backward but I think we're now reaching the point where we, our disillusionment is in fact experienced by many, many people in the Western world. The disillusionment with technology, with the whole economic system so based on competition, with what that is doing to the environment, to the world, the kind of rampant consumerism that has been unleashed by this economic system. And most importantly, we've had several of, of the myths of modernism shattered for us. The myth of progress. We and the United States, we are debtor nations now. We are no longer, and this is becoming so much clearer, we are no longer the political center of the world. And we certainly aren't the economic center. We simply can't believe anymore if we're thinking in progress. You see, I think many Europeans lost that belief during the last two wars. But we now are beginning to doubt that tomorrow will be better than today. And you see this in a lot of polls conducted in Canada. Most Canadians don't think that they will be better off tomorrow, next year, than they are right now. And we're talking about a recession. That's a very important shift. It means we've lost 
the social basis for being optimistic. We're also losing our belief in the myth of mastery. Our belief that if we just work hard enough, find the right technology, make the right discoveries, if we meet often enough, talk often enough, we will be able to overcome any problem. We will be able to master a situation with enough know-how and can do. And I think we're wondering if that's true anymore. We've developed these great technological inventions, these machines, and now these machines seem to be running us, seem to be determining our lives. We're not so sure of our know-how and our can-do. We're not optimistic. We're not so sure. The social basis for that has been jiggled. So we are entering, or maybe have been for some time, in a post-modern world where the kind of governing myths and images which were really quite integrated of the modern world have fallen apart. And we're left with little bits and pieces. We don't have one sort of view of the world. We have views. We have bits and pieces of philosophies and theologies from the past. But very few, hardly any theologians, would dare to claim that they have some overarching whole view and vision of the world. We have fragments of meaning. And many people experience this as a fragmented life. Their life seems more a collection of bits and pieces than something quite whole. So, given this fragmentation of experience, I've said often and elsewhere, and I'm, I don't want to repeat myself here, but there are at least two political ways of coping. And I'm not talking about political parties, but of stances in life. And I think in the face of all the fragmentations, conservatives tend to want to paste the pieces together, to force them together, to go back to some time when there was a more whole way of living. It's a very coercive way. And liberals, I think, are, see the fragmentation also, but they're worried about the kind of coercive power that conservatives use. So they just want to make sure that every piece uh, has some rights and that there are not some rights that are stronger than others. And so these are two ways of coping. You find them in society, you find it in the church. People trying to say, what do we do with the fact that our whole worldview is kind of breaking up? We have to cope with this fragmented experience. And what happens, at least as far as I can see from the newspaper, is that the conservatives and liberals keep fighting with each other about the solutions to this kind of situation. And the conflict goes on and on, and it's very predictable. And my reading is, and it doesn't go anywhere, because all it is, they're both just ways of coping. And I think a serious question for us in the church and in society is whether we want to continue this conflict, whether we want to perpetuate it. And I mean that. I think, you know, life is very short. <laughs> we have one life. We have one world. We have to really decide which conflicts are worth it and which ones aren't. I think we have to enter into the conflict of our time. But which conflicts promise life? And which ones don't? 
And sometimes I think we perpetuate conflict simply because uh, it's one way of ensuring that nothing will ever happen. It's a little bit like the husband and wife who argue every day about the car and they keep the conversation going day after day, year after year about who's going to use the car. Conversation never goes anywhere. And what, in the process, it means they have both saved themselves from having the deeper conversation of whether they really want to go anywhere in the car together. You see what I mean? We can perpetuate some conflicts because we don't want to deal with deeper ones. So my question is, what conflicts in the church and in this country are worth continuing? And what ones must we just say, no, I won't engage in that anymore. I don't have a lot of answers on that, but I think it's an important question at this point when we're dealing with a fragmented experience. I think it's a time when we as individuals and a church need to become not so much theologians as contemplatives. Now when I use that word, especially in a Catholic audience, a mostly Catholic audience, I know it conjures up pictures of monks and nuns and so on, withdrawn in silence, solitude. But I don't mean that at all. I'm talking much more about our need deeply to experience God as the center that holds together all the fragments of our lives. And I think I can best illustrate what I'm saying by telling you the story of a friend of mine who's very busy. Uh, she's working, her husband's working, they have a little boy. And she was telling me, you know, I run around like a chicken with my head cut off. I do this, I do that. I get up in the morning, you know, I change the baby's diapers, I get breakfast, I make lunch, I go to work, I work overtime, I come home, I work on supper, my husband does the dishes, we clean the house, we get this, you know, then I prepare for next day's classes, and then by about 10.30 at night, I'm just exhausted. And she said, it's all this bits and pieces. It's her daily experience of fragmentation. And she says, sometimes I just don't know what the point of it is. And she says, you know, the one thing I just love to do. At night, I love to go upstairs to my little boy's bed. And I just sit there beside his bed. And she tells me that he looks much better asleep than awake. And she says, I just love looking at him. I just, just love just to sit there and look at him. And she says, and then it's like all the fatigue drops away. And I know the point of it all. Now I think that's her contemplative moment. All the fragments of her life come together. And she knows the point of it, the purpose and the meaning of it. That's what I mean that in these times, we as individuals, and I think as a church, need contemplative moments. And I think we as a church, without in any way being arrogant, 
because there are many ways in which we are post-modern. Sometimes we're hardly even a modern church. We've hardly even become a modern church and we're almost post-modern. But in these times and in this place, I think we live in a dispirited culture, a culture that isn't sure of what's the point of it all. We're all, all this activity in our society, and what's the point of it? What's the meaning of it all? And because that deeply religious question has been lost somewhere in a vital way, people are dispirited. There is a lack of energy and a sense of direction in this culture. And in the first talk I referred to a couple of recent sociological studies that show in Canada, you know, the mainline churches have become kind of flat. People keep going, sort of. But they are not experienced as centers of spiritual energy. And that is so important because we are in a culture that so is so hungry for the spirit, for experiencing what is the point of it? What point, what is the point of my being that gathers up all the fragments of my experience, of our experience? And so I think, um, and I'm just beginning to think this, I hope you will help me think about this. That we as Christians need to see ourselves as called to speak the word in a post-modern world. That we need to call one another forth in a new sense of mission. To preach good news without being arrogant, but with a great sense of we are as much in need as anyone. The vision is an alternate vision of society. It is the vision of the reign of God that we find in the scriptures. It's not a vision with a lot of detail, but its outlines, it seemed to me, are clear enough for us to risk our lives on. It is a vision of the human person as graced and sinful, a vision of human community and solidarity. So let me talk first about a vision of the human person that may give hope in a dispirited society. I think that those of you who are mothers here have some privileged insight into the infinite value of the human person. I think sometimes, maybe only late at night, but sometimes you have this vision of how this little child, this one person, can be a whole world in himself or herself, a world that is infinitely lovable. And I think this experience can give us an intimation that if this is true for this one little smelly bundle of joy, this may be true for everyone, that each person may be that precious. I think we may have some similar experience when we see somebody who is so obviously gifted or so obviously lovable. Their value seems unquestionable. 
And yet, against that experience, we have other experiences. We encounter people who are mean, people who are cruel, people who are mediocre or destructive. And in, I know many teachers who have this double experience with children in their classroom every day. Some are just so easy to love and others are very, very difficult at all to love. So my point is that human experience gives us some intimations that everyone is of in, 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 infinite value, but it doesn't automatically convict us. So it really is a radical act of faith to believe that we ourselves and others are infinitely valuable. Not because of what we do, not because of how we look, where we're from, but simply because we are created by God. That is a vision of faith. It's the vision of faith that has grounded many of the wonderful secular values of the value of the human person. But these values have become cut off from their religious roots. We need to find those roots again. The value of the human person ultimately is guaranteed by God. If we believe in God, then we believe that we ourselves can, and this is the amazing thing, we too can become a guarantee for another person's dignity, for their freedom. And I think that it is this belief that we can be guarantees because God has granted us life. This is the basis for any kind of work in justice and peace. I think if we don't have this vision, and I'm saying it so simply, if we don't have this vision, then we are forever going to be dividing the world between those who are valuable and those who are not valuable, between the rich and the poor, Christians and non-Christians, people from certain parts of Canada and not from others, the healthy and the unhealthy, men and women, the born and the unborn, capitalists and communists. We will be dividing the world. If we don't have this deep belief in the value of the human person, politics will become, as it is in Canada, Today, the management of conflicting interests, the prerogative of whoever has the most money, power, or privilege in this country. The other side of this biblical vision of the human is that the vision that the person is fallible, weak, and sinful. In other words, we are not perfect. Now, Christians often have been criticized for this rather bleak view of the human person. But I think it is a very socially liberating view. In this century, we have lived through far too many political experiences, totalitarianism, fascism, Stalinism, these efforts to make human beings perfect and the elimination of those who are not perfect. And we have far too many books on pop psychology, books telling us that we can and that we should be healthy. And what an exhausting enterprise that is. 
So I think to see the person as weak, as fallible, there is something in that that can be liberating in its own way. The biblical vision of the human is a vision of community and solidarity. Without this vision, we may care for people we know, for those who are nearest and dearest to us. We may feel some sense of solidarity, for example, with people from the same region, people of the same sex, people in the same church, whatever. But there are so many people who will necessarily then fall outside the universe of our moral concern. And so how can we care, and we must, in this country, however that's defined, whatever the borders are, we must care for the needs, not just of friends or allies, but of strangers, of people we will never know or never meet. It's the basis of any possibility of justice. In my own work in various solidarity groups, I've come to see that you can't argue someone into or out of that kind of care or commitment. It really is an act of faith. It's something you believe in. It becomes stronger when you put it into practice and act on it. I think ultimately our care for others is based on the belief that we are all created by the same God. That what we have in common, really, isn't just that we all call ourselves Canadians. It's not just that we're all flesh and bones. It's not just that we're all here on the same planet what we have in common is God. That's what we really have in common. I think these are some of the roots of a biblical vision, an alternate social vision. But it's not a picture or a program. We don't know exactly what it means in any and every circumstance. But it's enough to go on. It's enough to sustain hope, I think, in the here and now. And without such a vision, I think, as the psalmist says, we as a people will perish. I'm using the word vision directly because I ultimately believe that all social transformation ultimately relies on the transformation of our imagination. That it's not enough for us to critique what's going on in our culture. We need to be able to imagine the possibility of something better in this world. So how can such a vision be living? How can it compel our sacrifice? How can it enable us to turn our lives inside out? I don't think that's an easy question to answer. I think in our churches, and I put myself in this, that very often in this society, we have tried to sell religion. We have tried to make it more acceptable, more trendy. 
it has become a consumer item. And in the process, it's like religion has just become another thing that we can take or that we can leave. And there are people who are very worried about that, and so they act not in spiritual ways, but in very political ways, trying to force people, in a way, into the church. And I think this crisis of the mainline churches, the effort to sell religion that is really failing, that it should force us if we have our minds and our hearts open to a profound conversion of ourselves as Christians and as the church, that we must be inspired by the Spirit of Jesus. We need to know that this biblical vision has a name and a face. The name is Jesus. We should not be embarrassed about speaking this good news. I realize that what I'm saying is quite simple, and some may say it's even simplistic. But in my conversations with people across Canada, I have been so impressed with this thirst for the Spirit. And it is not a thirst that is being met. I think all of us are thirsting. And I think to the extent that we allow ourselves to feel the infinite desire that we are for God, that we will respond and come to know our call in this time and in this place. I think we as a church, like my friend, need to know that this is the point of our being. Some of you will say, How can we do this? And I have to say, I don't know. But it's not the most important question. The first and the most important thing is for us to awaken in one another the desire to ask that question. How can we preach in the spirit of Jesus now? So we need to awake, to evoke and provoke the desire to follow Jesus and to live the gospel. We must move away from trying only to make religion psychologically useful or politically meaningful. And I have done that. I'm not putting myself above anybody here. And I think I realize that I have underestimated both my own and others' need for God. Not a disembodied God, but God who lives and breathes through human realities. Over, and this will be by way of conclusion, over the past year, I've had a number of opportunities to talk with students at universities and high schools. And I have kind of reached the point where what I have to say takes about five minutes. And I say something like this, and I'm using it as an example, simply because I think it says something about how we are called to be and what we are called to say with our lives as church in this society. Young people are in the process of discovering 
and shaping their identity, your identity. There are those who will tell you that you are what you do, or how you look, what you earn. There are those who will tell you the lie that there is nothing worth living for or dying for in this culture. And it is a lie. It is not the truth. The truth is that you are of God, that you are with God, and that you are for God. That's who you really are. There are those who will tell you that you will be happy if you look out for number one, if you make it. But that is not the truth. What is true is that you will be happy if you care for others. You will be happiest if you are sacrificing your life for someone else. to die for because it is only then you will know what you are living for somehow and somewhere I think we must speak this simply without compromise or justification Underneath all the culturally accumulated layers of resistance in ourselves and others, I do believe there is in this country and in our church a desire for the irresistible message of the gospel. And once we understand that this is really the truth of our context, that this desire is underneath all these cultural, economic, political arrangements. If we believe in that, we will know the truth about our time and our place. The problem, I think, for us as a church is not that we ask too much of one another, it's that we ask too little. We often, you know, and I put myself here, we spend a lot of time discussing who should be preaching from the pulpit. Should it be priests? Should it be lay people? Should it be men? Or should it be women? It's a very important discussion. But again, it's a good discussion as long as we are saying to one another, every one of us, in all times, in all places, we are invited to speak and to act the message of the gospel with our lives. Thank you very much. Any little fragments are most welcome. When you go up to the mic, if you could make sure to really speak into them. I think this is for the case of the, re- the recorder here. When I read the title, Dr. Letty, 
the mission of the church in a dispirited society. I was thinking more of the mission of a dispirited church in society. I have the impression that uh, we Christians think we have the monopoly of truth and of life, and we are deaf to the spirit talking to us through the communists, the Buddhists, the Hindus, the natives, the animists. And I believe the spirit is much more alive in them than in us very often. That the church is not all yeast, there's a lot of dough. And there is as much dough in the church as there is yeast, and there is as much yeast in society as there is dough. And we have to be more open, listen more to what we think of others. Okay, I think your question, and I'm, thank you for your comment, Josh. Um, is a good example of how each of us can be influenced by different contexts. I think there are some people and some places who have experienced all too easily really the arrogance of the church in thinking it has this monopoly of truth. And so therefore the, your caution is well taken that the spirit moves throughout the world and in other religions. But there are other contexts in this country and in the Western world, I would say, where Christianity is not at all arrogant. It is almost totally apologetic. It is just retreated into in adapting anything and everything from just about any, like, for example, learning all kinds of Eastern stuff and forgetting to learn anything from the contemplative tradition of the church. And now my experience is more that, that the church is just insipid. It's not at all arrogant. It's just totally, you know, very busy. <laughs> very busy. Totally apologetic, bending over backwards to be politically correct on every issue. I mean, it's exhausting. <laughs> and, and that is of equal concern to me. Because I think we, as I said, what I'm trying to say is we may be neglecting something in the process, neglecting to see that there is an authentic need in this culture and in ourselves as well that we need to respond to without apology. Is that helpful? Anyway, thank you for saying that. I realize it's awkward to get over to those. Uh, you really have to want to ask a question here. <laughs> I don't want to ask a question. I want to make a response because I feel I would be remiss after that terrific presentation. And for me, I want to jump for joy because I'm what's called a community development worker. And <laughs> my job is to be out there on the front line. And I think it's talks like this that I come to to get inspired, to keep me on the right track. And I like what you said about uh, religion. I used to say, we'll sell it for $3, and if it doesn't go, we'll sell it for $1.98 and maybe 50 cents. And some of my feelings is like I envy people who are in the field of theology, because I do community development, I suppose you'd say, by the seat of my pants. And I'm always trying to keep up, but I need people like yourself to keep giving me the inspiration and the theology to keep my prayer life alive. Because when I'm out in the field, it's difficult because you're dealing with the day to day. And you run into the two sides. The people who are the victims, you try to show them that they have some freedom. You're trying to deal with both sides and you really have to have your feet on your ground. And, and I really need to come and hear this kind of a talk and I just really appreciate it. And today I go back invigorated and ready to take on the world again. Well, thank you for your kind words, but also to say that uh, you know, some of my friends are community development people and I, you know, they inspire me. And I'm sure that you do many people too. And, you know, I think in this time, 
And the reason I just accept what you're saying, I'm not going to play false humility. In this time, we do need to encourage one another. We really need to give one another courage. Like I think if you're at all in, in community development work or any kinds of, the kinds of things that some of you are in, it can be discouraging because sometimes there's so much sort of backbiting and infighting and, you know, all the petty little things where people are kind of sniping away at people. And if you really consider, and this is true in the church, and we do a lot of this pot shot, if you really consider what we're up against, like the powers of darkness that exist in this world, you know, huge, nameless, faceless systems that are killing us. You know, we can't afford that. You know, we can, we have to give one another courage and to build one another up. And I don't mean in some sappy, soupy, strokey uh, affirmation model. I mean really like Peter, you know, when he was at the gate of the temple and the man who was paralyzed was there and he didn't say, you know, I really affirm you, you know, whatever. And he didn't knock him down any further either. He said, in the name of Jesus, walk. You can walk. And I think that as Christians, you see, that's the basis for us to give one another courage. You can do it because of the spirit of Jesus among us. We can do it. And I'm going, I'll really get into a homily here. <laughs> Another... I'm afraid I'm going back to the, to the dispiritedness aspect. Okay. Go for I know it. you ended on a courageous note, but uh, you made the point that uh, the church may not even have come into the modern era, and now we're talking about the postmodern era. Right. And I, that's the point I wish to go back to. Um, if we can even uh, hypothesize that we might have lost our youth because of the church's stand in sexuality, that even in that point, we might not have come up to the, to the modern age. And if we can even uh, say that is one point, you know, where people just seem paralyzed. What can we do? We have a, a great hope, a wonderful man, but yet at this time, uh, we seem to be just uh, paralyzed. And uh, all the time, you know, it will take faith tell the church to get up and walk at this point. So mm -hmm. Would you say a few words about that? Yeah, uh, um, the Pope is interesting in this regard because it's a bit like a time warp. His critique of capitalism and c consumerism, modernism and all that, I think is excellent. I mean, it really is a very important critique that needs to be heard. Uh, and it's a critique of modernism both in the communist and the capitalist forms that that's taken. The problem is it's a little hard to respect if you feel the person hasn't been through the process of appreciating what has been good in that. You know, like, it is a good, you know, we owe a debt to the modern mentality of the respect for the individual, democratic principles, tolerance, Pluralism. You know, those are values. Now, if somebody communicates this feeling that they don't appreciate those remarkable achievements, then if you're criticizing it, it just appears like they're somewhere back in the Middle Ages. You know, so I think um, it's a challenge for, not just for the Pope, but for all of us to have genuinely appropriated the values of, of the world about us that are good, and to also be very critical of, 
of what is not good. And I think in the time after Vatican II, uh, many Catholics, you know, really just uh, were so enthusiastic about what's going on in the world that they were really critical of the church. And I think we need, I think we're probably more at the point now where, you know, we need to be critical of the church, but also critical of the world, but in a way that somehow, uh, how can I say this? That we don't define ourselves by what we're against. You know, I think it's a very dangerous thing, spiritually, socially, whatever, to define oneself only in terms of what we're against. I think that's why the church was in trouble in the first place at the time of Vatican II, because it defined itself by being against the world. Now, that could happen again. Or we can define ourselves as being against the official church or against, you know, now in any of those cases, I think that's a very risky thing because we as human beings need to live from this, this infinite capacity we have to be for something greater than ourselves. Now, my experience is, is that you are really, if you are really for justice or peace or something, you're going to run into difficulties inevitably, but at least if that's not your focus somehow. That, uh, any more? Uh, do you want to develop that further? Question? No, it's okay. Let's, uh, we don't need to stick on the topic. But if you want to come back on it, please do. inspired by your talk also, sister. Uh, you said that we should take contemplative moments. Could you expand on that a little bit? Because I really love contemplative moments. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I'm assuming that the vast majority of us can't um, go off to a monastery, you know, and maybe shouldn't. Uh, but I found this story with my, of my friend, and I've used it in a lot of places, and people find it very, very helpful, because it, it is that question of finding moments, in, either in the day or at certain... Uh, now, she found it with her child. Other people find it simply by being quiet and just to be with God. It's that simple, you know, even if one doesn't say anything or one doesn't think anything or whatever, to simply physically say, I'm just going to be here and I'm going to be with God and I'm going to be for God. Just, just physically to say that, I'm just sitting here for this reason only. Well, you're just acknowledging right there the whole point of your life. So that somehow, I think in ways that we don't know, that inevitably gathers up all that we are. And I think it places it in, in the realm of love. And I think there's certain, I don't think I probably don't have time to go into it here, but I think there's certain maybe techniques that might help one to sort of sit a bit more still, <laughs> which is the big challenge. But the important thing is to want to do it. And in that, we need one another. I think you know, we need to, to phone people, our friends, you know, we need a little group to help each other with things like that. Yeah, I think we'll call it a call it a series. Right? Thank you very much, Dr. Lady. It is now my privilege to thank you in the name of all of us here for the half pilgrimage you invited us into. Not so much a head trip as 
to go to the inner core of our being. I remember a Hindu friend of mine saying that, we, you Christians, you have a noisy God. And the noise deafen us and so we can't hear our neighbor calling us to share. Dr. Lady has beautifully illustrated Whitehead's recommendation, seek simplicity and distrust it. In the interest of clarity and communication, Dr. Lady neatly simplified her insights so that we could all understand them. She pushed herself into simplicity. And this is necessary to be a good teacher and a good journalist. And yet, we must always be aware that every simplification we make is an overgeneralization. That we seek simplicity, yet we can never trust it. We need to be aware of our omissions. And that is what Dr. Leddy warns us against. I would like to thank you very much, Dr. Leddy, for the courage to face the topics you have chosen, namely to develop a Canadian theology from the core of our personal being, that every one of us is the church. The church is not for people. The church is you and I. It is of people. Thank you very much, Dr. Little.